Well, it's great to be with you guys or have you guys actually here with us, whether you're joining online. Um, if you don't know me, I was the guy in the video that used to have hair and everybody laughed really hard. I don't know why that happened. Uh, everyone talks about like the glory days being back then, but like to me, these are the glory days. You feel it? You feel it? Okay. Anyhow, uh, today I get to kick off our, our anniversary series. We're going to talk through some of these things. And so for me, it's, it's kind of cool to get to do this. Um, this actually marks for me 21 years this week that I've been in Hawaii. So 21 years ago, um, I came. Thank you, Creighton, for clapping. I appreciate that <laughs> pastoral encouragement. Um, but the reality is, it's like I actually had no plans to ever come to Hawaii. Where I was from growing up, people only talked about Hawaii as a, a place that was like vacation. You know, I was like quintessential, um, just completely ignorant of the culture and how this place is so robust and family just had no idea. Except I did know that I didn't grow up a Christian. So maybe you're here today and you're checking out church for the first time. And so if you are, we're glad you're here. If you're invited, this is a safe place for you to figure stuff out. But for me, God became so real when I was young. I just saw him do some radical stuff. It wasn't just culturally that that's what I was taught. I just saw God. And after you see God, there's no going back. There's no going back. And so I remember I was like, hey, you know, I I feel like God said, "I, I want you to be part of planting churches. And where I was from, everybody would go to this school in California. And it wasn't necessarily anything wrong with the school. It's just the batch of people that came out of the school. There were a lot of my friends, but they came out. They had a lot of head knowledge, but they didn't know how to do it, if that makes sense. They, did, they, did, they just sat in a classroom. And again, I'm not throwing rocks at the school. But I had a friend come by, and they just basically said, hey, there's this school I heard about out in Hawaii. Why don't you go there? So I went home, I looked online and like, this is barely when the internet was jamming, you know, like took forever to load up. You remember that noise you know what I'm talking about? And the website pops up and something in my heart was like, you're supposed to go here. But for me, I'm like, that could just be bad pizza. You know, like God, you got to speak to me. And so I remember I was praying and then I was going to speak that summer at a youth camp and the, the, the team came back and said, Hey, we just got this worship team. They're actually affiliated with Hawaii. This guy, Wayne Cadero, blah, blah. And it was the school. And I was like, what? That's crazy. But that could be coincidence. So God, you, I'll go. You just gotta, you gotta tell me. So then my pastor comes up. He's like, I just got back from Hawaii. I went to this like practicum thing with Wayne Cadero, church planning, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what? Like I hadn't told anybody, right? My plan was I was going to go to the University of Oregon and be a duck. That was my whole plan, right? That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a winner. So anyways, um, (laughs) it's an important, write that down just in case. So The reality is, though, I'm sitting there in that, and then the third thing was, like, my youth pastor's wife, who she didn't know anything about what I was considering in my heart, she just came and she said, I don't know why, I've just been praying about you in Bible college a lot. I said, okay, God, you don't have to write it in fire in the sky, but the problem is, is, like, I I grew up in a single family. I had, like, my dad was completely gone, just poor, and no money, grew up on welfare. I was like, how on earth am I going to afford college? First one my family is ever going to go to college, let alone college in Hawaii. How am I going to do this? So I go out to the mailbox, and in the mailbox, I open up the, the, um, the thing, and apparently my dad, who I hadn't seen in years, he qualified for disability, so all the child support he was never paying anyways actually got transferred to the Kulion of the state. And so in my hands was a check for like $14,000. Mind you, this is pre-2000 when $14,000 meant something, right? And I remember sitting there, and I was like, and anyone want to guess how long four years was at this little tiny school that wasn't even accredited? $14,000 exactly. So I jumped on an airplane. I landed here. And let me ask you a question. Do you think that I knew I was supposed to be in Hawaii? 100%. I got a $14,000 check. I have all these different signs going there. Matter of fact, within the year, that's when Creighton actually met me. Uh, Creighton mentored me for like 20 years. I remember, I, I was like, you guys got to understand how I was like the Howley of Howleys when I moved here, right? <laughs> I, like, I, brought, I just brought some senior, I'm going to trust you. I brought some senior pictures, even just to show you how bad it was. Like I was the quintessential guy. The only time I ever went to Hawaii, I stayed in Waikiki one time. And then I thought I knew about Hawaii because I bought one puka shell necklace, right? <laughs> You laugh, but check this out. These are my senior pictures right there. <laughs> Look at that. Now, mind you, I didn't even know how to smile. This one. <laughs> Let's say, right? Both sides, just in case. Got all this stuff on that, right? I don't know you're laughing. I look good. So, no. Now, here's the thing, though, okay? Here's the thing. I can tell you the story of that. I can tell you all the things that God did, right? And here's what's crazy. I could, how, can we take that picture down? I can't focus. <laughs> I don't have a blank slide after this. Just make it go away. Okay, perfect. So, <laughs> but the thing was, 
was is in this thing, here, here's what's crazy is I was so sure I was supposed to be in Hawaii because I was. We planted this church within a year of me starting this journey. Me, Creighton, Noah, and Fernando. And what happens sometimes is when you're sure that God's spoken to you, sometimes what will happen is you will act, attach expectations that go with it. So because I was sure it's God's will and I'd seen such provision, what I was expecting is everything to go smoothly, everything to go easy. I wasn't anticipating relational hardship. I wasn't anticipating nights where it's like, I just want to quit because when it got so like, these were some of the best years of my life and the hardest years of my life at the same time. And I can just remember being in some of these times, like three, four, five years in, where it's like, I see so much fruit out here, God, but inside I feel so much death and I don't understand why. And what happens sometimes in our life is we make this false expectation of because he's spoken about it, because he's pointed away, because he's confirmed it, we think it's going to be easy or think it's going to be just like a walk in the park. And he never promises it's going to be easy or walk in the park. What he does promise is he'll walk every step with us. And what you're going to find out a lot of times is Mon already alluded to this. God doesn't waste our hardships, guys. A lot of times he's more concerned with what's happening in you than what's happening through you certain certain times. And there's transformation that kicks in. And the reason I bring this up is today, I'm not, I'm not talking about just the story of the church, but I'm also talking about your story. There's some of you in here that you've had a lot of times where you've seen God actually show up. Times where he watched him show up in one of your kids. Something that he just confirmed that there's a plan and a purpose for your, your son or your daughter. Or times for you, maybe it's how you got into your marriage. Or maybe you're on a business venture that you know, it's like God led me to this. But what happens is, is we know it in the moment and then we get into the hard time and it's like we forget the start. Does that make sense? We just forget it. And here's what's crazy for me. When I started getting into those hard times early in the days of the church, I remember every time I told the story I just told you, you know what happened in my heart? Faith would rise. Faith would rise. Why? Because I'm testifying. I can't go back and unchange. He for sure called me here on that. And if he called me here and if he put me here, he's going to provide for me. He's going to make a way for me. And even though things are hard, he's going to come through in the end of it. All I have to do is not give up. Does that make sense? And there's something that happens when we're able to remember what God's done in our past. It gives us faith for our future. I just want to let that sink in because for some of you guys, here's the big thing. You're struggling today or you're in a hard time and you feel like you just want to give up. And the secret today, I feel like for some of you, it's not necessarily something new. It's actually remembering what he's already done. And in doing that, you'll see something transform inside your heart and your life. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in two places today. Uh, One's in Psalms, the other's in Joshua. Now, what I want to tell you about this is when it comes to talking about stories and understanding different things that happen, there's this really uh, specific passage in Psalms that I really love. And it says this, it said he made known his ways to Moses and his deeds to the sons of Israel. Now, if you're not a church person, let me give you a little back context. What he's talking about is the people of Israel, they were in Egypt for 400 years as slaves. There was like a million of them and they were just in hard, hard labor. And what happened was God raised Moses up took them out of Egypt through crazy miraculous signs. This is the Red Sea splitting. This is all these things happening. Took them into the desert, led them by a pillar of fire, a pillar of cloud by day. I mean, just radical stuff. But when it goes back and talks about this in Psalms, what it says is, is two things happened. Moses, he understood God's ways. Israel, they only understood God's deeds. Now, what's the difference between those two things? Let me show you. Both people experienced the exact same circumstances. Both people experienced when they were in the desert and water, they were thirsty, water started flowing from a rock. They experienced when they were pinned in by Pharaoh and his Egyptians in the chariots, the Red Sea split open and God himself fought their battle. They experienced every morning, there was bread on the floor, their clothes never wore out, their sandals, this is like for 40 years. They had the same experiences, but one group could look back and they could tell you about the story and the facts about the story. Moses, on the other hand, can look back and tell you about God and who God is and how he operates. Let me just put it in a different phrase is there's going to be a difference between understanding the facts of a story and discerning its meaning. I could go tell you, dude, you want to hear a cool story? I got $14,000 in the mail one day. It was the coolest thing ever. And I could tell you a story. You'd be like, that's cool, right? But if I tell you the facts of the story, what's the purpose of that check? 
The purpose of the check was God telling me, hey, from the beginning, when you embark on this, I will provide for you every step of the way. You think you don't have enough? You have enough. You grew up poor? It doesn't matter. You feel like that? I will walk with you. Does that make sense? Now, sometimes what happens though, and this is what happens for you and for me, sometimes when God shows up or sometimes when things happen, we settle for just being able to say, I'm so glad it happened. I'm so glad God did this. But many times when God shows up, he's also trying to reveal something about himself or show you something that he wants you to know or wants you to learn or wants you to remember. Use the the people, right? Use the people in the desert. When God's doing, providing manna, he's not saying, hey, listen, you're hungry. Let me just make sure I take care of that. What he's saying is, is I will feed you always. You do not have to look other places. Every day I will provide for you. You do not need to worry. When he goes and he starts to do the water, I'll be the one that sustains you, satisfies you. When it splits the Red Sea, he's saying, I'm going to be a protector for you. I am a protector. It's who I am. Next time you encounter something that you're afraid of or people that you're afraid of, you don't need to be afraid because I don't change. This is my ways. Now, what's crazy is you watch when they left the desert, the next thing that happens is they come into the promised land and they encounter another big force. And guess what they do? They run in fear. Why? Because the Israelites only understood God's deeds. They never really understood his ways. Does that make sense? And I would love to tell you today, I'm like Moses. I understand God's ways. I'm like the Israelites. Can I tell you that? I've had God do so many things in my life. And when I start facing the same circumstance again, fear starts ripping through my life and doubt all over. Like I I have this crazy thing in my life in provision. I told you that $14,000 check thing, right? I've never had a lot of money. I still don't have a lot of money, but I can tell you all these stories. Like my son, when he was um, born, he was born three, he was three pounds. So he's in the hospital for 81 days. And then the bill came for that. And right when we got in the hospital, um, my wife, you know, she worried about my son. I checked on my son. He looks good. He's healthy. And then I started thinking about how are we going to pay for this? Anybody else relate to that? Right. And if you say it out loud, your wife's going to kill you in that moment. But I just thought about it a lot. Like, how am I going to pay for this? You know, $825,000 is the bill when it came. Now, come to find out insurance covered most of it. So it's down to just 2,500 bucks, which is an act of God itself. But I still don't have 2,500 bucks. There's a guy that I used to know in my church who's not there in that. He's in North Carolina. He moved. He doesn't even know I'm in the hospital. He comes home one day and he's like, I feel like God told me to write a check to TJ for $2,500. He sends it in a card and I'm sitting there in the NICU and I open it. It's like, are you joking me? Like crazy provision. Like, wow, thank you, God. Or like we bought a townhouse out here. Couldn't afford it. Did something in faith. The appraisal came back on the townhouse that the offer we made was too high. So the sellers are like, hey, we're going to just drop this $13,000 for you. And they had choke offers. You know what I mean? And it's like, because you don't have any cash. So I could tell you all these provision things, right? Just crazy stuff in my life. Do you know what happens when I look and I don't have enough at the end of the month sometimes? I don't go to God and say, God, you're such a provider. Will you take care of me? I start freaking out. And I start saying like, I thought you had my back. Where are you? And then he provides at the end and I'm like, oh, just kidding. Sorry. You know what I mean? (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. But the reality is though, until I learn his ways and stop just settling for his deeds, I'm just going to go on the same journey over and over and over and over again. And there's got to be a point where you and I, when God shows up, we don't just say, thank you, Lord. Like we sang, we do do that. But we also say, God, would you reveal yourself to me if there's there's anything that I'm supposed to learn or anything about you that I'm missing. Because a lot of times when you understand the things that he's done, it will give you faith for the things he's going to do. Does that make sense? I mean, even our church, that's the story of our church. It was no joke. Like you saw a little bit Creighton talking about this, but like when we started, some of you guys weren't here for early new hope days. So like 20 years ago, that's when I came 21 years ago, new hope at Farrington. It was like 12 to 13,000 people a weekend at that church. It was nuts. Like Marty was there. Tim was there. Every church that planted like Leeward, they had like three to 5,000 or something crazy. Hawaii Kai blew up. Like it's true. We had eight people in the seats. Now that wasn't just for one service. That was for like months, months. And everybody would go and you don't know this stuff. And Creighton, I don't know if you would tell your story or not, but I'm going to tell just because I have a microphone. So, um, (laughs) But what would happen in those early days is it's like Fernando and Creighton, they would go and they had these like tables with like Kirk cloth and they would hit their knees when no one else could see them. And they would just start to pray because what was happening is, is there was a wrestle in all of us of like, well, we're doing all this. 
how come we're not as big as everybody else? Where's our fruit? Where's our relevance? And what the Lord was doing in that moment, he was just scrubbing our hearts. He's like, you got to get this out of you because you're not going to be the biggest church. By the way, that's not the metric I'm using at all with you. You're going to have an incredible kingdom impact and it's something in there. And man, he washed it. But if we don't process it, then we're just up in fumes. We're angry. The truth is, is God's doing exactly what he wants in that moment. But sometimes we don't take the time to actually process it. And the truth is today, you might be in a moment just like that. Maybe you're facing something in your family. Maybe it's something in your health. I'm not saying that God's like causing all these things to happen to you, but I am saying he's not going to waste anything that happens to you. But we've got to sit and be able to really learn and discern. This is the key to maturity. Listen, in faith, maturity is not the equivalent of years in the faith. I've been in the faith 10 years. You can still be a baby after 10 years. Believe me, I know. I've been a baby for a long time, you know, like, but in that processing, in that teaching, in that humility, God search me and know me, change me, transform me, allow this to kind of sink in, allow this to change and transform. So I just want to ask you today, what stories do you carry? And more important than those stories, I'm not even asking, can you tell me those stories? What I'm asking is what's the meaning of those stories in your life? Yes, they are for God and they are for his glory. And that is enough if that's anything else. But oftentimes he's going to speak something to you. Some of you guys, the key to your marriage breakthrough is actually just remembering remembering what he's done in your marriage because it's going to cause faith to rise up that if he's done it before, he can do it again. Some of you guys with your kids, they're off on a dark path and your heart is broken and you're freaking out. I want you to remember the times that God showed up in your kid's life and begin to pray for them from that place of faith and not freak out from a place of fear. Although I can see how it is. I have kids. I, I, when I drop them off, it freaks me out inside. If something happens, if they did this, but when I remember, no Lord, you said this, you did this, you've done, it just changes everything. But one is, I understand his ways, the other deeds, okay? That's the first part of today. Second part's gonna be this. After we get this out of Joshua, here's something that God did all over that I think we missed that I'm hoping we do today. So what happens is, Moses parts the Red Sea, boom. They go through the desert, everything, and they come to the edge of the promised land and Moses dies. Joshua then takes over. One of the first things Joshua does, he goes to the Jordan River, which picture this massive river that you can't just cross, And as he goes to the banks of the Jordan, just like God says, the river dries up just like the Red Sea dries up. Now, this is huge for Joshua because what it's communicating, a couple things. One, God is with them. But two, it doesn't die with Moses. It's everybody knows the story of the Red Sea in that group. So now they're seeing the same thing happen through the next leader. And they're like, whoa, God's going to be with us forever, right? So they have this huge moment. They all cross a million people. They cross through a second body of water that just dries up. I just, if you could really imagine that happening, that just blows my mind. Like that would trip me out. Now, if that was me and I stood by a body of water, like imagine standing at the Aloi and all of a sudden it just went Like, and then you look down there and there's like fish with four eyes and they're just hanging out, you know, like (laughs) sitting in that kind of space. But imagine that happened. I would tell myself, you know what? I will never forget this as long as I live. Never. Can I tell you what God thinks? Yes, you will. I'll show you why. This is what he says. First thing. Now, when the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua and he says, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from each tribe and command them saying, take up for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firmly and carry them over with you and lay them down in the encampment where you'll spend the night. So in other words, the river's still separated and he wants You're already all the way across. I want you actually to go back, send people to go back into the middle of the river, not the sides and pick up stones. Why? So Joshua tells him, go across the ark of the Lord in the middle of the Jordan. Each one basically doing what he says. Why? Because this shall be a sign among you. When your children ask later saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. Now, we can read these things really quick, but I just want you to think through what this is like. There's a whole body of water still separated. They're supposed to go pick up stones. So I I was going to illustrate this actually in person today. Because like when you say pick up stones, I think of stones like this big. You know what I mean? And if you can imagine like... 
I'm going to put 12 little stones right here and it's going to last forever. And people are going to walk by and look at 12. That makes no sense. You know what I'm talking about? So I brought these like, um, the, these kind of like, uh, they're from my gym. These, these like, uh, medicine balls, like strongman balls, like type things, like 70 pound balls. So I need a couple guys to pick them up. So, Oh, Matt, Matt Rosen, right back there. Matt, can you turn around and grab that one back there? And Brett cheered extra loud, so he'll grab the other one. It's over there. So <laughs> wait, wait, but I need you to see you're supposed to pick it up because these are not small, right? It says pick them up and put it on your shoulder. That's where it goes. So Brett, go ahead. Seriously, you're F45, bro. This is your moment. Let's go. <laughs> Yo, you're about to work out for free. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, the Matt's bringing them up right here. Okay, good. So he's bringing one up. Can you grab that one? So that's like, I should have brought the hundred pounds for you. <laughs> Bro, you're strong, dude. Okay. I didn't have you stand for the rest of the time I preach. So <laughs> now you can put it down actually. No, okay. So put it down. Whoa, Brett's strong too. Okay. Go ahead and put it down. So <laughs> this is our humble youth pastor. Brett. <laughs> okay. You guys are good. That's all I need. Okay. So get them mad. Now, were those light or easy? Were you nervous picking it up? Nervous, yeah. So I'm not even going to try to pick it up because I turned 40 and that's not happening anymore. So the whole thing in here, though, I just I want to point out, like, when they're doing this thing, it's not some little, oh, okay, I'll do it really, really quick. They have to go in the river and pick these things up. Like, these things are not light. Like, they're heavy. And imagine, I imagine it could have been even heavier, right? But they're bringing something that takes work and they're laying it down. And the sole purpose for them to do all this extra work is what? So they don't forget. This is water parting before your eyes. How, like, I would be like, I'm gonna, I would never forget that. But the truth is, is when we're in our moments of pain or when we're in our moments of prosperity, we forget. We forget where we've come from. We forget who put us there. We forget the provision along the way. And on top of this, God's saying, I don't also just want you to forget, but I want you to do something to make sure that these stories come up with your kids. They come up with people around you. That people see this big thing that you built and that they look back and they say, what does this thing even mean? I say, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you about the Lord and his ways and who he is and what he's done for us. What I want to suggest to you today is that it's not enough for us just to talk about the stories that have happened. We've got to be a people that also make sure that we don't forget what he's done. And I just want to ask you, not in judgment, but what have you done to make sure that these stories get passed on. If I can just talk to parents here for a second. You know, a lot of times as parents, uh, I worked with youth ministry for a long time, I worked with young adults, and oftentimes I, I've met, met very few parents whose heart isn't for their kids. They have huge hopes and dreams, and a lot of times with their hopes is they, they hope their kid, they see the faith, or they, they see the hard work, or they pick these things up. But oftentimes, if I can say something as a fellow parent now, oftentimes it stops at hope, if that makes sense. Well, what we're hoping is, is just somehow they'll just catch it. Somehow they'll just through osmosis get it. And I think what God's saying is, don't leave it to chance. Don't leave it to osmosis. You need to plan intentional ways to pass these things on to future generations. Like no offense, but like hope's not a great strategy. Hoping something happens doesn't mean, I'll use a non-parenting analogy. Imagine you're single I was single late in my 30s, but imagine I'm hoping to get married one day. That's my plan, okay? I'm a guy hoping to get married. And imagine I just keep hoping and I never ever ask anybody out ever on a date, right? So like, tell me how this is gonna work out. Like, how, how do you think this is actually gonna play out? Like, I'm hoping in my room praying and then someone comes in and just, God sent me to marry you. Like, that's how this is gonna work? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Seriously, like, but it, th there's, there's, there's work, there's intentional things where it's like, what have you set up? Now, we're not going to just, this isn't like a what have you done type thing. We're going to talk about this, but I, we're going to give suggestions that kind of jumpstart this for us. But this is important. Like even today, we're doing this anniversary thing. This is not about celebrating 20 years and just the good old days to see four. This is about learning the things and the ways because the future God has for this church, our glory days are still yet to come. Like it's, we're, we're not here yet in this, but we're doing a 20 year remembering thing. Why? So we can tell stories of well, how we got here. Like this church has survived multiple lead pastors. Do you know, for most churches, that's the end of churches. Usually when it transitions to another pastor, their glory days oftentimes can be behind them. 
But our church, just, I mean, the stories of what God's doing in the youth, the healings that have happened, the people that are coming. Some of you guys, your stories just encourage us, just brand new into this place. But it's this time where it's like, okay, we set things up. We make the video. Why? Because we don't ever want to forget because it gives us faith for where he's going to take us to go. And we want to be able to do that. So just in case you think this isn't just a one point thing, I'll just show you in a couple other places in scripture. This is Exodus, not Joshua. This is before and that it says they're talking about some of the, the stuff with redemption and animals, but it says, and when you, it shall be when your son asks you in time to come saying, what is this? Sound familiar? Then you shall say to them with a powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. This is from Deuteronomy. It's right after they give the law. This is the Shema. It's one of these big passages. It says, and you shall repeat them diligently. Say diligently. Diligently Diligently to your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, when you get up, you shall also tie them as signs to your hand and they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. You shall also write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, all the way through, God is like, these things are so important that I've shown you, that I've done for you. You need to make sure that they're front and center. I'm not saying every single shirt you wear needs to be like, Jesus said this, right? I'm not saying you go, but I am saying if there's nothing that we have that our kids are going to come across. If there's nothing that we have that when we look at, for me, like when darkness hits, I, 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 I can show you a ton of different stuff, but when darkness hits, We think we're going to remember, but I just cannot tell you when darkness hits, we are so fast to forget. So fast to forget. And what the Lord is saying is, I have such a plan and purpose for you. The only thing that can undo that plan is you. There's not a person that can undo it. There's not a circumstance that can undo it. There's not a diagnosis. But Satan, when he comes at us, he knows we have God given authority now from Jesus. And the only weapon he can do is to try to lie to us or trigger us enough that we stop operating in a place of faith and we start moving towards a face of fear or start moving towards a place of doubt or regret. But it's all our choices. So what God's saying, just keep this loud and clear all around you. It'll make a difference. So then the question then is like, what kind of things am I talking about to remember? Just give some practicals for this. I don't want you to walk out with just like a, a concept. So I'll just give you a couple things. Here's some things to remember. One is like times that he came through and saved you. You should remember these things. It's not because you don't have to remember everything, right? It's not like I came to church today and I all had all green lights. I'm going to wear green only for the next three months (laughs) to thank God for green lights. Like that's not the level I'm talking about. I'm talking about these major moments when you got saved, like Mana. Mana was perfect when he was up here sharing. Could you feel his story on that? Oh man, every time the guy, the things the guy's facing, it's nuts. But he tells his testimony a lot and you can just see faith. You don't sense fear going in there. But he, because he knows God saved him and he's seen God show up and continue to save him in different ways and places and stuff. So this is when you came to faith. It's a big thing, but it's also times that you made terrible choices and God saved you. You have any of those in your life? Maybe you did something in your family that caused a lot of chaos and a lot of pain. And instead of you reaping all the pain from that, God showed up and he put something back together that was broken. And when you remember that, it's like, oh, you, you know what the other thing that happens is when you remember times that God saved you when you messed up, you know what also is a byproduct of that? Compassion. Because sometimes what happens is, is we're so grateful and compassion, but then we forget. And when someone else does something wrong, we just want to judge them and stick it to them. We want to hold them to their past. But when you remember what he's done for you, it's really hard to hold people to their past because I didn't deserve the things he did for me and you didn't either. And then even though the person I'm in relationship with, maybe they don't deserve it and they're repentant and that, but it makes no sense to not forgive when we've been forgiven so much. See how this works? Other things, things he's provided, not just financially, but relationally. Like maybe there's certain times where God put the right person in your life. I grew up with um, no dad, right? My dad was completely gone. So everybody has their stories, all these lessons they learn. I don't have anything on that. But you know what I do have in my my story? God's given the most incredible mentors all the way through my life. I've just had incredible mentors. Creighton's one of these mentors. I mean, because of Creighton, my life was changed forever. I didn't know this. Last time I spoke here, he got up and told me, (laughs) do you remember saying this? He got up here and he was like, oh man, I used to only like mentoring Eagle Scouts, people with like big (laughs) degrees, private school, and then you came. And I was like, What? (laughs) What? <laughs> wow. But 
Apparently that's true. So um, the thing with it, though, no, we're just joking. <laughs> I have, a lot of, I have a lot of times God provided for me. So now when I come up things, because some things still happen. There's certain things that come up. I just became a dad like a couple years back, four or five years ago. I'm like, how am I going to learn to be a dad? I never had a dad. You get all upset in that. And it's like, TJ, you've had so many mentors along your life. He's provided so much. Is he really not going to provide someone to help you right now? Is he really not going to do that? Words he's spoken over you. I wish I brought this book. I'll bring it next service. But like, I, I have, there's times when people give words. Like, I love coming to the prayer team in the front. And I love not telling them anything. You just pray for me. Because sometimes what will happen, God will give a, like a word of confirmation of something that's hidden in my heart. And it's like these things, it's like, okay, the body of Christ is meant to confirm stuff. Matter of fact, you might be here today and you might be new to church and you're thinking, I've never seen God do anything. I'm not even sure if God's real. And maybe you're in a, a tough spot or just need encouragement. Here's what I want you to do at the end of service. There's a prayer team up in the front. I just want you to come up for prayer. And here's what I want you to tell them. I just need prayer. Just some encouragement. And they say, well, tell me what's going on. I just need prayer, some encouragement. And don't say anything else. <laughs> Literally, why? Because I'm just telling you, when you encounter the power of God or somebody speaking something, it's, it's just the craziest thing that happens. But if you're here and you're new or you don't know, here's the thing about God. He doesn't care what your past is. He doesn't care if you messed up. He doesn't care if you made a ton of mistakes. He doesn't care if you don't have any faith right now. Maybe you're here today and you feel like I've known God, but I'm just, I'm just dark right now. Great. You're in the right spot. Just come up for prayer because that's a great thing about God. We think we got to fix ourselves before we go to him. And he's like, I'll take you in the middle of your mess. And I'm going to work a miracle in that mess. If you'll allow me and let me talk to you and to do that. Okay. So to kind of wrap this thing up, here's examples of ways you can do this. Okay. Because here's what I feel at the end of this, where we're going on this is if we're going to get to the future that God has for us, both in our life and in this church, it's not going to be enough just to come into environments and just get an encouraging word. We've got to start to embody the word. We've got to start to carry the word. He talk about a season of advance. And what advance simply is, is it's just allowing God to do everything he wants to do in you and walking you into the dream that he has in your life. And there's every single person in there. He's put a dream there. He's put something wild that he has for you. So here's a couple ways you can do this. Simple. One, you could just put a picture up in the wall. This is something that I have that we start doing in the home. And part of the reason is, is when I see some of these pictures or when the kids ask, it gives me a chance. So this is one of my favorite pictures from my wedding. I got married about 37, 38. We actually got married in a circle. Um, and the reason was, is because we just, it's been so long that we just understood that marriage isn't just a ceremony and it isn't just a solo thing. God does things through community. And in the middle of our ceremony, we just had a couple of people come and pray that really the guy that's wider than me in that picture is Dave Barr. And so, um, <laughs> you can tell him I said, that's my buddy. He's the one looking up to like heaven on that. But man, when they prayed in that moment, can I tell you, I just felt God's presence. Like I had not felt. And some of the words that they spoke were words over my marriage in that. And I have this picture and you know what this reminds me of that Jules and I don't have to do marriage alone. I could tell you the story how Jules and I got together. It's a crazy testimony. Like, you know how you have that like love at first sight thing? You walk in, like, that's the one. That was not us. Like, <laughs> literally, Jules and I were enemies. Like, I'm going to confess. She'll be proud I told this story. I was a young adult pastor of this church. And my friend, because she was coming on to hang out, just a group of friends. And like, I don't know why, but she kind of just bothered me. And I was the pastor. This is terrible. They're like, you need to be nice to this girl and get to know her a little bit. Okay. So I was standing outside talking to her in the parking lot. And, she, and I, I've never done this to anybody else. I can't believe this is a true story. And I was sitting there and I, I said something and she said something else. And I was like, Whoa. and then I, I like, I looked at her and I go, I don't like you. And she was so shocked, right? She's like, well, well, I don't like you either. And I was like, great. We're on the same page. And then I left. That was what I did. That was a true story. When she tells this story, she's like, thanks pastor. Like, I can't believe she's around, but like the story of how God put us together after this is wild. It's absolutely wild. So much so that the meaning of the story I would tell you is I know for sure that's the woman God picked for me. I know it for sure. And I know he put people around me, but do you know early on our marriage when fights break out in that, the dark thoughts that come into your heart, the dark thoughts that come into your mind, you start doubting all sorts of stuff. Maybe this was not the right thing. Maybe this and that, and that's nothing against her. I'm just talking about when darkness comes for us, it comes hard. But when I tell that story, when I remember, when I look at this picture, it's like, TJ, what are you talking about? 
If I operate from this is the woman God gave me and I know it for sure, I act different and I act from faith. Does that make sense? This picture also reminds me, dude, you can reach out to anybody at any moment. Now, again, this is just normal marriage space. We see how this works. In the moment, you don't remember that. Other things you can do, write a list and revere it yearly. I have this. I put a list of all the ways that God showed up. Ken and I were talking about that. He says, dude, remember that this was early today. Remember the time God did this for you? And I was like, oh, I forgot about that. I forgot. That was just like a little bit ago, right? And so like this morning, now I've read a list literally this morning. He's like, remember that happened with your taxes and blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, dang, I forgot. So <laughs> got to write it down. But then as I start writing it out, why? Because I review one of these every day when I start my day. I really do. It's on the front of my journal. I'll bring it next service. But the reason why is it starts my day from a place of faith because my circumstances don't say faith to me. Anybody else? My circumstances say hard, different things. How's this going to work? What about this? How's this going to happen? And it just hits me. And so what I want to do is I want to start from a place of remembering what he's done in the morning. I start in his word and I do this. If I come to fresh fire, that's what I do here. I spend time in the word. I worship, I pray. I'm going to do this. Have a special meal once a year. If there's something that happened, just do, dedicate a meal. Now, if you think about it, even Jesus did some of these things. This is what communion is. Communion. Now, let me say communion isn't just simply a meal of remembrance, right? There's something else that happens, but he starts communion when not after he dies and rises from the dead. He starts the night before. Why? It's like, think about it. They're about to see somebody get crucified and then they're going to see him rise from the dead. You think anyone's ever going to forget that? Apparently so, because he says, <laughs> do this and do this often. But hear this, this happens to me and you too, because once we get saved, we know it's all God. But then for some of us, we still live like it's all up to us. It's all on our shoulder. We shift back to religion. I get what I deserve, how I perform, how I do this. And the cross is a reminder that you get way better than you deserve and that he is everything that you have is from him and through him. Does that make sense? But these things that kick in or you could just fast once a year and just focus on gratitude. Just focus on a gratefulness. God, this isn't even for anything else. It's, it's just because of everything that you've done. I just, I want to spend time remembering that. Now, listen, these are not biblical mandates. These things right here, you don't have to do all these things. The biblical mandate is you do need to remember. You do need to remember. Now, I just want to say something else is if you don't do it for yourself, I just want to tell you, can you at least do it for future generations? I've never seen generations like I have today that are under such an onslaught about who they are, what's true, how life works. I mean, I just pulled this picture up, but you just think about it like, People just get bombarded with story after story after story after story. And the truth is, is what they're actually looking for is something authentic, something that's real, something that's tangible. And listen, you carry these stories. Some of you guys are in here that are Kapuna. You have keys to your whole legacy and generations within you. But if we keep them within ourselves and we don't bring them out and we don't bring them to remembrance, it's like, this is a legacy you're meant to pass on. And so just to kind of close, it's kind of two things on this. One is what are you going to do to ensure you don't forget? But more important than that, we're just going to take a moment here. And it's simply this. We're just going to begin to ask God, Lord, is there anything you have done that you want me to remember today? Because here's the reality for this kind of stuff. This, I was trying to think, how do you, how do you do this? And how do you convey this? Because even as a church, like, I don't know how to express this any stronger, but like, this church was not man's idea. Like C4, it's been a God breathed thing from the beginning. And as somebody who's seen it for 21 years, I, I just, I don't know how to say that any stronger. This is not about a brand of a church, a way of a church or anything else. It like watching Fernando lead and Dale lead and Creighton lead and all these people lead over all the years in that. The only thing it just makes it so clear is like this thing is meant to be a move of God that gives God radical glory in the islands. It's not anchored to one man. Something just crazy on that. But the key to get there is not man's wisdom. It's not man's understanding. It's not the best church growth thing, everything else. The key is this radical connection to God and allowing him to speak whatever it is he wants to speak into our hearts. 
And one of the things that we've got to get to a shift is that we don't become just a church that we come here because these guys hear from God and they help us. We've got to begin to begin a church that every single person that's part of this church has a connection to God, that they can go to God at any moment and just begin to ask, Lord, what is it that you want me to remember? Lord, what is it that you want me to do? And when this thing comes to life, your life will never be the same. So I was going to end this thing. I was going to do this big, powerful story or big something else. But it's like, in 20 years, can I tell you, the big, powerful stories are great. They encourage me too. But one word from God directly to my heart is way better than anything like that. And so today, what I wanted to do is we would close is I just wanted to take a moment of just, Isaiah is going to pad back here. And I just want you to ask God, real simple. Say, God, is there anything you want me to remember today? And then just relax. He might bring a memory. He might bring a thought. Maybe you'll see a picture. Maybe nothing will happen. But what's important is if you posture yourself like this, you're going to be somebody like Moses, who doesn't just have the deeds of God, but understands his ways. Because he promises us, if you'll seek me, I will be found by you. And that comes from people that are first time in church till you've been born in church. So can you just bow your heads? I just want to just put us in a moment of prayer. So, Father, I thank you for my story, the story of this church, the story of each person in here. But more important than anybody's story like that, I thank you for your story on the cross and what you did. When you died on that cross, you ripped open the veil to the secret place. We can all have access to you. There isn't anything that we've done or are doing that prevents that from happening. And so now, fathers, we're in that place. We just want to ask you, God, Is there anything that you've done that you want us to remember today? And if so, how do you want us to do that? Just wait on you.